Joyce Meyer Ministries dankt haar donateurs die deze uitzending mogelijk maakten. Honestly, when you come to church, sometimes you get milk, sometimes you get meat. Now, a lot of people, babies love their milk bottle. They love that. The Christians that aren't ready to grow up, you start trying to give them meat and they're going to spit it back at you. Everything that God asks us to do, he also gives us the power to do it. He gives us the grace to do it. So whatever God is dealing with you about right now in your life, how many of you God is dealing with you about something? Anything at all? Something? Okay. Two things, maybe, you know, okay. <laughs> all right. The biggest mistake you can make is to try to do it without God's help. The first thing you got to do is say, I hear you, God, but I cannot. However, I'm willing to let you do it through me. I'm willing if you'll help me. Now, we're partners with God. He does not do everything for us. But we can't do anything apart from him. So one of the biggest mistakes we make is, well, I need to do this. I need to do that. See, if, let's just say, for example, I mean, a lady came to our church years and years and years ago. She got up every morning at five and she prayed till nine. Well, she seemed real spiritual to me, so I thought, well, I'm going to do that. <laughs> well, you already know where the story goes. I'm not going to labor with it. I mean, I locked myself in a room, got my clock, got my coffee, started praying. And I mean, in five minutes, I'd prayed about everything I knew to pray about. And I, you know, <laughs> but I had, I had told everybody, well, I'm, bless God, I'm going to pray four hours every day now. Well, I wasn't doing it because I was being led by the Holy Spirit to do it. So anything we try to do because we're trying to keep up with somebody else, that's becoming a law to us, and God's not going to help us do that because he doesn't want you to try to be somebody else. He wants you to say, God, what do you want me to do? And then whatever he shows you to do, he'll help you do that. Now, I don't mean that we can't learn from other people. We can learn from other people. Other people can be examples. There's not anything wrong with discipline. There's nothing wrong with saying, well, I'm going to, you know, I feel like God wants me to pray the first hour of every day. But if I'm going to get up and pray the first hour of every day, I better feel like that that's what God wants me to do because I'm going to need his help. And if I'm just doing it so I can brag to my Christian friends who do that every day, then it's not going to work. Are you with me? All right. Got to make sure. So, if I read this like the law, none of it is going to work. What we need is intimate relationship with Jesus, and when we have that, then everything works. The law, everything becomes a have to. I have to go to church. I have to pray. I have to read the Word. I have to confess the Word. Got to memorize the word. I have to tithe. Everything becomes a have to. But see, have to is dead. Jesus gave us a want to. If we follow the Holy Spirit, we've got a want to. I'm here tonight because I want to be here, and I believe you're here tonight because you want to be here. <laughs> Amen? If you have that mindset that you have to do these things to keep God happy, then it just sucks all the joy right out of it. You don't, you don't do anything to get God to love you. He is love. He already loves you perfectly. And when you know that, then you begin to respond to that by wanting to do what he wants you to do. I want to be the kind of person God wants me to be. If he tells me that I, I need to give up some more selfish habits, then I want to do it because I want to please him. Not because I think he's going to be mad at me if I don't, or I think he's not going to love me if I don't, or I think I'm going to lose all my blessings if I don't. I want to do it because that's what he wants me to do. Amen. Amen? So I hope you see that when you begin to do things because you want to, there's a joy in them rather than a feeling like, well, I have to do I have to do Okay, now, we continue to behold in the Word of God as in a mirror the glory of the Lord. 
and we're constantly being transfigured or transformed. Romans 12, 2 says that we are, we are transformed, completely changed by the entire renewal of our mind. So that little teacup started out a lump of clay, and after all that stuff it went through, it became this beautiful teacup. It was transformed from one thing to an entirely different thing. And I can tell you from my standpoint, I am certainly not the person that I was 40 some odd years ago. How many of you are not the same that you were, okay? And you know, that glorifies God. It glorifies God when people see you change and they see what God does in your life. And, and when, you, when you change from an angry person to a loving person or a stingy person to a generous person, the world needs to see us not just go to church. They need to see us change and represent Christ to them. Romans 8, 29. For those whom he foreknew of whom he was aware and loved beforehand, he also destined them from the beginning for ordaining them to be molded into the image of his son. So, we have been foreordained by God. That means he made this decision a long time before, before we ever showed up on planet Earth. Those that belonged to him, they were not gonna just get left alone to live their own little life and do what they pleased and act however they wanted to. We are, he, he predetermined and foreordained that we would be molded into the image of Jesus Christ. That means, here's the simplicity of it. Any person who will not let God do what he wants to do in their life, you will not ever be happy. See, if you don't let God do what he wants to do in your life, Oh, you may limp along and have some kind of a life, and I'm not, you know. You go to heaven because you believe in Jesus, not because you do everything exactly right here, but you won't be happy. I was a Christian for a long time, but I was not a happy Christian. And there, how many of you know there's a lot of unhappy Christians? Well, it's the devil, it's my circumstances, it's this, it's that, I don't have enough money. No, don't stone me when I say this, it's you. <laughs> Here's a little example I like to use. Clay, mine's not gray. Anyway, so we're gonna be molded into the image of Jesus Christ. Remember the teacup? Rolled and padded and smashed and flattened and so, you know, you just, you're like, I, I mean, I, obviously this clay doesn't have feelings, but if it did, I bet right now, it'd be saying some stuff I wouldn't wanna hear. <laughs> so, this is a terrible example, but we're gonna pretend like this is Jesus. So, <laughs> <laughs> now come on God knows my heart so this is you this is Jesus alright you got it so all of this is supposed to go in there well guess what uh oh we got a problem there's a bunch of stuff here that's gonna have to go And boy, we fight that, don't we? It's like, <laughs> See, I'm glad I got a bunch of people that know what I'm talking about. Finally, finally, finally. 
There you go, you made it. <laughs> How many of you wanna be spiritually mature? Okay, all right, just a few things. There is no microwave maturity. See, we say we want to get transformed, but really we want to get zapped. <laughs> well, you know what I figured out with God? He's a lot more like a slow cooker. <laughs> He's a lot more like one of these crock pots that takes all day, but boy, are things tender when they finally come out. <laughs> How many of you want a breakthrough in your life? Well, there's no drive-through breakthroughs either. Today you can get everything drive through, but you can't get, you can't get it, you can't grow up in God through drive through. You know what it takes? It takes number one, the word. Number two, and I can just tell you before you ever even really start trying to grow in God, you might as well take possibly a few years and learn who you are in Christ. You gotta know you're loved. You gotta know that your confidence can be in him. You gotta know that you don't have to live under the law. Here's the thing, and I'll show it to you in Hebrews chapter five. Let's go there, Hebrews 5, uh, 13. Paul was talking to, the, to them about why they were still babies. Babies. He told the Corinthians, he said, I wanna give you meat, but I still have to keep giving you milk all the time. So, honestly, when you come to church, sometimes you get milk, sometimes you get meat. Now, a lot of people, babies love their milk bottle. They love that. But Christians that aren't ready to grow up, you start trying to give them meat, and they're gonna spit it back at you. You say, what are you talking about? Okay, milk would be more like, God loves you, you're wonderful, you're awesome, you're amazing, <laughs> you're blessed, God's got a great plan for your life, every problem you have, God's gonna solve it, amen? We all like that, and we all need that. We all need that, we need to hear that. Anybody that's giving you a well-rounded message, you're gonna hear some of all of that, but we also gotta have meat, and meat confronts our behavior. Meat says it's time to not act like the world. Meat says it's time to get yourself off your mind and do the things that God is asking you to do. Meat says it's time for self-control. And so Paul said, not everybody is ready for meat. Not everyone who continues to feed on milk, not everyone who continues to feed on milk, and I love this, I hope you can get this, is obviously inexperienced and unskilled in the doctrine of righteousness. What does he mean? How, how are you, if you're still feeding on milk, why does that mean that you are unskilled in the doctrine of righteousness? You know what the doctrine of righteousness is? It means that First, you know who you are in Christ. He has come to live in you at the new birth, and your identity now is who you are in him. That's where your confidence is, that's where your trust is. You know that he loves you, he's never gonna stop loving you. And then, you begin to work with the Holy Spirit to let what he's done in you be worked to the outside of you where people can see it. Well, that takes correction from God. That takes chastisement. That takes the meat of the word. Now listen, don't lose me, but if you don't know who you are in Christ, every time you hear something that corrects you or confronts your behavior, it's gonna condemn you. Now I'm just gonna take my time to make sure you get this because I didn't have anybody telling me this like I'm telling you. It took me years to get this figured out. And every time I would hear something that confronted my behavior or brought any kind of correction to my life, I mean, I would just feel so bad. 
Nobody's as bad as me. Nobody's got as many problems as me. How could anybody need every message they hear? I need everything I hear. <laughs> Come on, you ever feel like that? I don't care what you preach on, lady. I need it. Just, you know. <laughs> could you just tell me tonight Jesus loves me? Well, yes, he does. He loves you very much, and you're wonderful, and you're cute, and you're anointed, and you're talented, and God's got a good plan for your life. But grow up. <laughs> but see, as, as long as we got to like, we got to like them both. Then when, I mean, today, part of the reason to be part of a church or part of a group of people is to have some accountability in your life. Do you know that you cannot hardly find anybody today that wants to be accountable for anything? You know why? Everybody wants to do their own thing. Well, bless God, I'm led by the Spirit. Well, <laughs> well, maybe not so much, you know? Or what, what, happens, what happens now if, if a spiritual leader would try to actually correct somebody. Well, bless God, I'm out of here. I'm going to that new church down the street. <laughs> I don't have to put up with that. Who do you think you are to tell me what to do? <laughs> well, you see, if it's, if it's, I mean, either have a pastor that loves you or don't keep him as a pastor. And so if you have one that loves you, then you ought to be willing to listen to him yeah, you don't even want to clap for that, do you? Well, I'm not talking about somebody running your life. I was in a church like that one time where they didn't even want you to sell your, life, your house if you didn't get permission from them. That's off the wall and extreme. But now we're at the opposite end of extreme where people don't, don't you know, come in once a month, sit in the back row, don't know anybody, don't, don't say anything to anybody. Don't serve in any way. That's not, that's not why we go to church. You go to church to be part of a group. You're not going to get a check mark on your Sunday calendar from God. <laughs> you see how mixed up we can get about all this? You need to be committed to enough people that if you're not there and you're then somebody's gonna miss you and they're gonna come checking on you. Amen? And you need to have enough good friends that if you're acting like super stupid, they're gonna sit you down and say. <laughs> I'm glad you're laughing about this. <laughs> Everyone who continues to feed on milk is inexperienced in the doctrine of righteousness. And I love this. Of conformity to the divine will and purpose, thought, and action. For he is a mere infant, not able to talk yet. What in the world is Paul talking about? Of course you could talk. They don't know how to talk right. It doesn't take you very long to find an immature Christian. All you gotta do is listen to what they talk about. First off, they talk about themselves most of the time. The rest of the time they talk about their problems. Hmm. <laughs> Thank you for your excitement. <laughs> Ephesians 4.15. Rather let our lives lovingly express truth in all things, speaking truly, dealing truly, living truly, enfolded in love. Let us grow up in every way and in all things into him who is the head. The Holy Spirit is the spirit of truth. And when Jesus ascended, he said, I'm gonna send you another counselor. <laughs> Come on. I'm gonna send you another, yes, he's the comforter, but he's also the counselor. I'm gonna send you another counselor and he will guide you into all truth. Yeah. 
And the thing that I love about letting the Holy Spirit take the lead is he's never gonna show you something or deal with you about something if it's not the right time in your life and if it's not gonna be for your benefit. So, wonder what all God's dealing with people in here about tonight. <laughs> just, just think about even one thing. How about an attitude? Has anybody, God been dealing with you about an attitude? Oh, six people, great. <laughs> How about anybody God's been dealing with you to be more generous? Uh -huh. Uh -huh. How about, has God been dealing with anybody about maybe getting committed to serve in some area? How about a little more discipline and self-control? <laughs> I want you to make a decision. I want this time that you've spent with me to bring you to a point of decision that now is the time to do the things that God has been asking you to do. You see, here's the thing. It's not gonna get any easier. The longer you put it off, the harder it's gonna be. And see, God has a timing. And when we move in God's timing, now listen, there's an anointing. And that anointing makes things so much easier. It's like there's a smooth flow when we get in God's timing. If you try to wait till you're ready, <laughs> we need to learn to promptly obey God. Do what he asks us to do when he asks us to do it. Amen? Amen. I had somebody on my heart this morning and I just felt like I was supposed to call him. Well, I wasn't necessarily wanting to make a phone call this morning. And this was somebody that I hadn't talked to in a while, but you know, I've learned, and actually I'll tell you this, I think little acts of obedience sometimes are even more important than all the, what we think are the big things. Because you never know, what, you can speak one word to somebody that can be turn a whole day around for them just by being, and you know, life gets to be exciting. It, 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 takes on a, it takes on a much greater quality when we get up every day, not just trying to get God to give us what we want, but when we say, God, I wanna partner with you today in the work that you've got going on in the earth. Put somebody in front of me that I can help. Put somebody in front of me today that I can be a blessing to. And whatever you wanna deal with in me, deal with me. I don't wanna stay the same. The most frightening thing in the world is that I would never change. He changes us from glory to glory to glory. Well, we need to learn how to receive correction and conviction from God without letting it condemn us. That's the only way we'll be able to grow and spiritually mature. As soon as a very young girl reaches puberty and she's of childbearing years, you'll see these flags above their houses representing the fact that a young girl is available to a man, essentially on the market, up for sale. And at that point, her life changes dramatically. So what they do is they take him out of school, teaching them how to cook, how to be a, a wife in the, in the home, 
but part of it is also how to please a man. And that's through, you know, normal things in the house, but also sexually. So we are doing anything that we can to help people understand the value of girls. And helping these girls by taking them into a program called Imagine Hope. If they would live with us for six months and we would have devotions, lead them to the Lord, really mentor them in how to be a godly woman, and then at the same time teach them how to do some skills, basic things like jewelry making or whatever it is that they can have some kind of an income that they can bring to their families, we should give. And we should give to those that we don't benefit us. And I think that's what Hand of Hope does and, and we're grateful for that. It's very painful and difficult to go through life with a wounded soul. I know because for years I lived that way due to being sexually abused by my father when I was a young child. But I learned that God could heal even my deepest hurts if I would just open my heart up and let him in. And in my new book called Healing the Soul of a Woman, you too can discover how to allow God into those wounded places in your life. God has a brand new beginning for you, and you do not have to spend the rest of your life hurting. Bestel nu innerlijke genezing van de vrouw via onze website joyce-meyer.nl of bel 026 20 22 100. Al gezien, frisse impulsen. Nu bij Joyce Meyer Nederlands op Facebook.